Blessed be our Lord, one God, who guides us to this sacred house. Come, sisters and brothers, dedicate this day to holy service, working for six days to care for life, and on the seventh day to rest in the holy. Let us designate this day for growth and praise. Amen. Please rise.
please be seated. Now James and Grace Van Allen and Eleanor Graber of our church school will light our candles. James. Today we light the candles on our communion table in honor of two partner churches whose light comes from the life of Christ. We celebrate over 100 years of friendship and fellowship between us. Today, the candles of our candelibras represent the coming of the Holy Spirit as tongues of flame. Upon the heads of the disciples at Pentecost, we celebrate the continued presence of the Spirit among us. Let us pray. Holy God, you are the pillar of fire that leads us on our journey. By the power of your spirit, settle now into our hearts and illumine your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we light our candles, we reflect that these candles represent both our partnership with the Church of Kolishvar and that coming of the Holy Spirit among us. In a moment, I'll share with our children and with you the story of Francis David, one of the key figures in that Hungarian Unitarian Church, and how his story might illumine our own stories this Pentecost. At our last Pentecost service and our last Partnership Church Sunday, I shared with you a little bit about Francis David. Francis David is a hero for religious freedom and tolerance. Francis David also illumines for us a relationship with God that is at once personal and mystical. Francis David was a martyr to the cause because he refused to stop innovating. He wasn't content to just follow the dogma of the day, but rather he searched for a personal God. He searched for a personal God that he could be in relation with. And when that search yielded new insights, when that search gave him a fuller vision of that God, then he decided he must preach that God. In our parish house, there is a portrait of Francis David and that portrait is his appearance at the Diet. He is arms raised, proclaiming this personal God, but also proclaiming that we should be defenders of religious tolerance, proclaiming that his view should not win out, but that all views should be able to coexist. We honor Francis David today. We honor his spirit among us today. And we honor that spirit of fellowship and we honor that spirit of togetherness as we ourselves celebrate this Pentecost and celebrate the centennial of our partner church relationship.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O God, who didst teach the hearts of thy faithful people by sending to them the light of thy Holy Spirit, come to us as living fire. Burn in our hearts to melt the hardness, to temper the weakness, to lighten the darkness. Burn in our community that we may be inflamed with thy love, illumined with thy wisdom, charged with thy energy. Come to us as living breath. Breathe in our hearts to blow away prejudice and despair, to cool anger and bitterness, to freshen old ideals and dreams. Breathe in our community that we may be speakers of thy word, singers of thy praise, shouters of thy joy. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all humankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of thy people, that thou wouldst be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for the good estate of thy holy church, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit that all who profess and call themselves Christians and all those who seek thee by any other name may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commit to thy goodness all those who are any way afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, and especially thy servants, Emily Bieber Harris, Cindy Corb Wellington, Gordon Holmes, C.L. Hills, Lee Glenn, Elizabeth Thompson, Wadad Ayad, David Waters Sr., William Barthorpe, Daniel Worth, Clark Allen, D. Clark, Robert Gupton, Trevor Pinnock, Carl Henning, Douglas Kalenda, Teddy, Susan Mausiker, our partner church in Transylvania, beloved for 100 years, now serving Ukrainian refugees. We pray for those the world over who suffer from war, the people of Buffalo, Uvalde, Omaha, and many other American communities reeling from gun massacres, and those whom we hold up to thee now in silent prayer. May it please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we humbly ask as disciples of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, thou end and thou beginning of all journeys, we offer humble thanks and hearty praises for all thy saints who have found their journeys end in thee, including Francis David, and on this day, thy servant newly gathered to thy glory, George Corey. This prayer we make through him who promised us eternal life 
even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now, before praying the prayer that Christ has taught us, let us take a moment for silent meditation. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. lesson appointed for this day is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together. And suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues, as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under the heavens staying in Jerusalem. At this sound, they gathered in a large crowd, but they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded. And in amazement, they asked, are not all these people who are speaking Galileans? How d- then how does each of us hear them in his native language? We are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and uh, Asia, Phyresia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, in the districts of Libya near Cyrene, as well as travelers from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, yet we hear them speaking in our own tongues of the mighty acts of God. We were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. Here ends the lesson.
please be seated. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Ishtan Alja, greetings and blessings. As an octogenarian in a world that worships youth, I take great pleasure today in talking about something old. In fact, doing it in a worship service as well. Praise be to the century-long partnership church, the oldest Unitarian church in the world, in Transylvania, and the oldest Unitarian church in America here at King's Chapel. But did I say a century? What about four centuries, or even 20 centuries? In the next few minutes, I would like to help make a connection to the roots and branches of a distinctive Unitarian faith that's still alive. In a pictorial narrative of Transylvania's beauty and mystery, entitled Europe's Fairy Garden, full of pictures, the stories of the history, in the introduction, which is written by Laszlo Tokesh, who was the voice of protest in Temesora that toppled the communist dictatorship in 1989, a courageous voice, and he speaks about the various characteristics of Transylvania. But what he says is that two things define Transylvania the most. First, its ethnic and multilinguistic people, and secondly, its religious richness. He singles out Christian roots, and he cites the Edict of Torah as the foundation of tolerance, which manifests itself in that region in a multi-faith coexistence. I, like some of you, have experienced the religious richness in Transylvania, tangible and deep. It's caused many to call themselves pilgrims, and it's created for some a defining, if not a transformative, moment. And it has most unexpectedly awakened in me a religious kinship. Transylvania is 4,300 miles from Boston. Fly due east over the Atlantic Ocean, the breadth of Europe, cross Hungary, and land in Romania. There lies Transylvania, meaning land beyond the forests. In the middle of the Carpathian Basin lies the city of Cluj-Napoca in Hungarian Kolesvár. But travel a thousand miles farther, this time southeast, and you find the more ancient roots of religion for us. Imagine entering the gates of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago on a weekend with crowds of people gathered for the Jewish day of Pentecost. As we heard in the scripture reading, there was a great sound from heaven and a mighty rushing wind. And Peter, one of the apostles, spoke and then the others spoke, but in the language of the people who were there. And it was about the good news of Christ. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, which Jesus once called the Spirit of Life. 3,000 people were converted. And from Jerusalem, that spirit would spread to other nations. And 1,500 years later, Christianity had dominated Europe. 
So let's return to Europe and Transylvania and to Kolishvar, where a defining moment occurred in the 16th century. There a prophet arose, whom you've already met, David Waters, Ferenc David. He was a prominent Catholic who convinced King John Sigismund to issue an edict proclaiming the right of every individual or community to practice religious beliefs in his or her own ways. And that was legacy led to the founding of the Unitarian Church, whose lamp of religious faith could not be extinguished by persecution, by genocide, for the next 300 years, 300 years, the churches of Transylvania and their devoted ministers sustained people with this faith. When they were persecuted and their churches closed because Unitarianism for a while was illegal, they would keep the faith alive. Let's fast forward again, this time to the 19th century, the 1800s, and we will see another defining moment. Unitarian churches had been established in England, and King's Chapel had become the first Unitarian church in America. These churches began to realize, in a personal way, the depth of their religious roots in Transylvania. In the first half of that century, Two books got published, one from England, one from America, that made a difference in people's thoughts about relating to Hungarian Unitarians. And in the second half of the century, there were at least two trips, well recorded, that spawned further connections. And here I would like to uh, mention the travel accounts of an Englishman and an American because they give us a glimpse of what was happening 300 years after Ferenc David. The first account reveals how the faith of these Transylvanian Unitarians, despite all else, held the standard for religious conviction and freedom and held it fast. A prominent English Unitarian, John James Taylor, visited Transylvania in 1868 for the 300th anniversary of the Edict of Torda. He wrote that when the day for the tercentenary came, the town of Torda, not a large town, was filled and the church overflowed. After a hymn and a prayer, the sermon was delivered by Ferenc Josef, the minister of the church in Kolishvar, our sister church. That eloquent discourse was well received, and it reveals how freedom of religion was still prominent after all of that time, and the mission to protect it was imperative. Far be it from me to limit freedom of faith and conscience to Unitarianism exclusively. I only wish to show by the example of Unitarianism that religious liberty is really in a better condition than it was that it has now struck so deep a root in the hearts of millions that no power on earth can any more eradicate it, and that he who at the present day should attempt to employ a difference of religious beliefs as a weapon against his fellow man would deservedly draw down on himself the condemnation of the world. Indeed, it is high time that the last spark of intolerance should be put out, that men should be united to each other by the Christian feeling of brotherly love. The second account of a trip reveals how pastoral practices in the villages also held fast, and the bonds of religion grew even stronger in those villages. A prominent American Unitarian minister, James Thompson Bigsby, visited Transylvania in 1883. He described the authenticity and hospitality 
of the Zekler villages and how the ministers and their families lived in parsonages with just enough land to raise animals and grow food, about 60 acres, but limited salaries, rarely exceeding $125 per year. Their livelihood depended on hard labor in addition to pastoral and pulpit duties. And none but the most devoted could have possibly taken this oath for ordination. I will neglect none of those things that contribute to our holy religion. I will shun no service, however hard, though it be at the peril of my health, my worldly goods, or even life itself, provided it promotes the growth of heavenly love and righteousness. And this is how Bixby explained that enduring relationship between congregation and minister. Their superior education, enthusiasm in their work, and the traditional veneration of the office, which here has not yet lost its hold on the people, give them high and general respect and efficient influence in the community. Their hearers' hearts are not benumbed with the chill of the critical spirit, nor their flocks divided into unsympathizing theological wings or social factions. An earnest preacher, therefore, finds a warm response to his appeals, ready disciples and co-laborers in his efforts for the intellectual and social improvement of the community, and soon becomes the trusted friend of young and old. What this accelerated travelogue into the 19th century tells us is that Unitarian relationships grew steadily and their religious roots deepened. Christian faith, standing on the solid foundation of religious freedom and tolerance, as well as the fidelity of shepherds and flocks in the village churches. And now, the tumultuous 20th century produced an even more defining moment. At the end of World War I in 1918, the Treaty of Trianon would award Transylvania to Romania. And as Hungarians, they would now become an ethnic minority, subjected to discrimination, intolerance, and violence. Tragically, church properties were confiscated. Cemeteries and cultural monuments were vandalized even before the treaty was signed. An appeal was made in 1919 by Josef Ferenc, Bishop of the Unitarian Churches in Hungary, entitled, Help Us, Help Us. The letter was a cry to American Unitarians and other liberal Christians for relief and protection. But soon after, that bishop was arrested and imprisoned. Hundreds and even thousands were ordered to leave their homes, taking scant possessions with them. Even more shocking to Transylvanians, the monument in Diva erected to the memory of Ferenc David, he had died a martyr in prison, was destroyed by Romanian soldiers. In 1920, a collection of funds was launched for the immediate relief of Hungarian churches. The associate minister of this church, King's Chapel, Sidney Bruce Snow, and a service was held here on his departure, traveled to Transylvania with $50,000 given by American Unitarians, and $1,200 was given by King's Chapel that was said to have saved the churches from extinction. And the following year, 1921, that would be our anniversary year, the minister of the Unitarian Church in Kolishvar, Gabriel Chiki, traveled to the United States. He had a dire message of cal calamity in Transylvania. During his visits, he proposed and led an adoption plan 
whereby American and Transylvanian churches would become sister churches. It would last three years for each, and they would provide material help and encouragement. And eventually, there would be 112 of these sister churches. And Sheiki spoke in King's Chapel when he was in this country that year, and he described the closing of schools and churches under the Romanian government, ministers beaten in public, church people starving and dying, adding that before coming to America on that trip, he had been conducting two to three funerals per day. Shiki then cited the words of Ferenc Davi. In 1568, Francis Davi pleaded for liberty in religion. We may be undergoing persecution. We may be deprived of our property. We may be beaten and killed. But the persecutors cannot take away our religious faith. Francis Davi taught us how to suffer and die in a heroic way for truth. Will you not help us preserve our common religious heritage? The following year, in the summer of 1922, Louis Cornish, president of the American Unitarian Association, led a delegation to Transylvania called the Commission for Hungarian Relief. And in response to the destruction and poverty there, pairings were created with US churches and King's Chapel established the first relationship with the church in Kolesvar, contributing $300 annually, excuse me, $500 for five years. And the church in Kolesvar presented to King's Chapel an ancient and embroidered embroidery, the altar cloth that's on the communion table uh, where we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. And this partnership was robust for the first few years, first decade. And then it suffered a long disruption because even more was in store. Worse, the worldwide depression, 10 years. World War II, four years. Soviet occupation of Transylvania, Romania. 42 years. The light was finally rekindled after Carl Scovel's visit to Transylvania in 1978 in the midst of the communist era. The groundbreaking work of Judith Gellard, we call her Zizi, in the 1980s brought to everybody's attention the plight of Transylvania and it led to the revival of the sister churches after all of that time. And then the leadership of William Schultz, president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, who traveled to Transylvania right after the fall of Ceausescu, 1990, and investigated, prompted the founding of the Partner Church Council. Since then, there have been exchanges of ministers, of parishioners, and many of our King's Chapel parishioners, such as the five trips made by Peter and Vicky Cacaluto, P Peter is here today, and Habitat Bills led by Peter Sexton, not to mention countless visits by churches across this country. As we conclude this travelogue through this arc of time on this anniversary, I see our sister church and the churches of Transylvania as authentic custodians of religious faith in the worst of times and the best of times. I see them holding fast to progressive Christian teachings and good deeds, preserving those religious roots for themselves and for others, for the rest of us. They demonstrate what Rabbi Hillel once said, if we are not for ourselves, who are we? If we are not for others, what are we? In our digital, materialistic, and divided world, 
These roots can fill a void. As individuals, churches, denominations, or nations, roots can make a difference. They tell us who we are and what we are. James Agee, the Southern poet, captured this universal longing to know who we are in Knoxville, summer of 1915. And he described an evening when his father and mother, his uncle and aunt, spread quilts on the grass in the backyard and lay there quietly talking as a family. And then he wrote, after a little while, I am taken in and put to bed. Sleep, soft smiling, draws me unto her. And those receive me who quietly treat me as one familiar and well-beloved in that home, but will not, oh, will not, not now, not ever, but will not ever tell me who I am. Today, we share the candlelight of these two sister churches as a guiding example of Unitarian spirituality and the hope of the future. That light has not flickered. It is now a torch for all of us to see. And it's the essence of Christ and the spirit of life. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Ishtan Alja. My dear friends, let us pray. O oh God, we come to you on this Pentecost Sunday, and we ask you to come among us. We ask you to send that spirit that you promised to be among us, to give us strength, to give us hope, to help us be your light unto one another. Amen. Dear friends, it is the Transylvanian custom that a short homily is given before communion. I will assure you that this will be short. <laughs> Last week, I spoke to you of a Pentecost 
that is interpersonal, that is communal. I spoke to you of that person who came up to me and said, Pentecost is around the corner. What can I do for an individual Pentecost? And I said, oh, I think we can't talk of an individual Pentecost. That tongue of flame comes down not on one disciple, but on all of them. And the gift offered is one of communication, is one of kinship that transcends barriers of language. But what Denton has illustrated for us this morning is that while not individual, Pentecost is personal as well as interpersonal. That travelogue taking us through the history of our partner church relationship, through the lives of several different people who have been touched by that religious fervor in Transylvania, that speaks to us of a Pentecost that is personal. Earlier, when I was slicing and preparing the bread for our communion with the children, I told them that the loaf of bread that we were slicing was itself a representation of communion. We used challah bread this morning. Challah bread, which in its making is braided. It's braided together, and that braiding represents communion and togetherness. This is what we find today as we celebrate our communion. We'll celebrate communion this morning in the Transylvanian tradition. That tradition is that when the bread is distributed, it's done so silently. In the West, we typically announce the body of Christ, or we say, do this in remembrance of me. But in the Transylvanian tradition, when a person is handed that piece of bread, the contact, the interpersonal relationship, is made without words. We abide with one another in this meal that we share at this table. It speaks to us of a Pentecost that is personal, even as it is interpersonal. May we take that sustenance, may we experience that personal and relational Pentecost and take it with us into the world. May it be so. O oh God, of whose gift comes sunshine and friendship and the glory of this day, who in the common things of daily life givest us thy very self, making of bread and wine the sacrament of thy sustaining presence. Strengthen and refresh us that we may seek thee eagerly, find thee surely, and serve thee faithfully after the example of Jesus Christ. Amen. Holy God, whose mercy is beyond our understanding and whose love has come to share our life, we thank you for the one who stands in our midst and invites us not only to this feast, but to the kingdom which it represents. Give us grace and courage to receive what it offers to us and to dare to obey you in the life that is left to us. As we drink this wine and take this bread, help us to know that we are one with the saints who live in you, and they are one with us on earth. And to you alone be honor, glory, power, forever and ever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, we invite you now to come forward and form a circle around the communion table. In a moment, we will pass the bread to you and ask that you eat as you receive. According to the Transylvanian tradition, we shall say no words as we do so, but rather look into your eyes. In accordance with our COVID policy, we will not pass the cup, but we invite you to please come forward 
as all are welcome to partake. Come forward now and gather, please, around the communion table. See that we are gathered and will receive both individually but also communally. Dear friends, we have received it that Jesus on the night before he was betrayed took bread and he broke it and then he gave it to all of his disciples and he said to them, take and eat. This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after dinner, he took the cup and after giving thanks for it, he shared it with all of them and said, this is the cup of the new covenant given in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. We will share this with you, and then we will all receive together.
Let us join together in this feast. Gather us or scatter us, O Lord, according to your will, but build us into one church, a church with open windows and large doors, a church which sees this world as one you love, a church which is ready to work, even to suffer and bleed for the sake of this world. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We invite you to return to your pews as you are ready, and we will continue our service together. I now invite Kathy German and Carol Kemp to come forward for our proclamation and presentation. Proclamation. <laughs> to the ministers, lay leaders, and members of the Downtown Unitarian Church of Kolishvar. Whereas our Unitarian faith in the United States and Great Britain grew from roots in the Transylvanian tradition, and whereas King's Chapel in Boston and the Downtown Unitarian Church in Cluj Napoca, Kolishvar, enjoy a common heritage of Unitarian Christian thought and worship, and whereas for five years from 1922 to 1927, King's Chapel and the Downtown Unitarian Church in Cluj Napoca were declared as sister churches, and whereas the ministers and parishioners of both churches have repeatedly exchanged correspondence, gifts, and visits for over 100 years, and whereas the minister of King's Chapel, the Reverend Carl Scovel, visited the churches of Romania in 1978 and established friendly relations with the clergy and parishioners of the downtown Unitarian Church, and whereas the wardens and vestry voted to renew this relationship with the downtown Unitarian Church of Kolishvar on January 3rd, 1980, and reaffirmed the relationship on March 1st, 1990. Therefore, be it resolved by the wardens and vestry of King's Chapel to commemorate the oldest continuing Unitarian Church partnership in the world, and to dedicate the worship service on Pentecost Sunday, June 5th, 2022, to the Partner Church Centenary as the guiding example of Unitarian spirituality and global harmony. Voted unanimously this 16th day of May, 2022, the wardens, vestry, and ministers of King's Chapel, Boston. This is the proclamation that we will take to Kolishvar in the spring, COVID permitting. In 2018, a group of King's Chapel members led by Peter Sexton traveled to Kolishvar, Romania. There, the Reverend Maria Reyes presented us with this painting. It depicts a rear view of the Kolishvar church and shows a buttress by which the church is supported by the theological school building next door. It is a metaphor for the church being held spiritually upright 
by the theological school. On behalf of King's Chapel, we acknowledge this token of friendship from our kindred Unitarian Church. Both of these items will be on exhibit in the vestibule as you exit for the reception. Dear friends, even as we near the end of our worship together, we are only at the beginning of another week together here at King's Chapel. Today is Pentecost, and this afternoon at the conclusion of our service, we invite you to join us for some delicious Hungarian treats here at the church, and at 1230, we'll have a picnic and we'll be grilling at the parish house. You are all cordially invited to join us there. I can assure you that we have plenty of hot dogs excuse me, hot dogs and hamburgers, uh, along with some delicious sides for you. So I invite you to the parish house, 1230, following this service to join us for our Pentecost picnic. There at the picnic, the children of our church school will be decorating cards for Ukrainian refugees. And our collection today will be taken up on behalf of those refugees as they're being helped by the Hungarian church in Kolosvar. On Sunday, June 12th, we celebrate our 336th birthday here at King's Chapel. We invite you back to join us for that birthday celebration. I'm told there will be cake, and we will also be welcoming new members. So join us for that celebration as we welcome new members into this beloved community. That is Sunday, June 12th. On Saturday, June 18th, we invite you to join us to rest and renew yourselves. Come and see us as we are hosted by Dick and Cynthia Perkins in Stowe, Massachusetts. There is a lovely um, uh, labyrinth there. That was one of my first experiences when I came to King Chapel that summer, was to walk that labyrinth with Dick and Cynthia. We invite you to come rest yourselves, renew yourselves. Rest and renew in community with one another as we gird ourselves for the challenges ahead. That is Saturday, June 18th in Stowe. On Sunday, June 19th, our guest preacher will be Stephen Kendrick. We'll celebrate Father's Day and we'll celebrate the baptism of one of our newest members. So come join us Sunday, June 19th to hear Stephen preach and to participate in a baptism. Today, as I mentioned, we take up our collection for those Ukrainian refugees that are being assisted by the church in Kolosvar. Our collection will be sent to the Providence Charity Organization that does that work, and our offerings will now be given and received.
as we leave this place, James and Grace will be distributing carnations to you as we go. They'll be doing so on both aisles. These flowers are a symbol of our relationship with our partner church in Kolishvar. So we ask that you take them as symbols of that relationship, as symbols of the new life that arises from that relationship, and as symbols of this season of Pentecost. And now, may the voices of the bells follow us in benediction. The bells of Kolishvar ringing peace to the entering, and the bells of King's Chapel ringing blessings to the departing. Amen. <laughs>